turning your Bibles to Malachi or Malachi, the Italian prophet. We made it. I, I'm, I'm sad that we only have a couple weeks left in the uh, minor prophets. It, it's like journeying uh, through, these, uh, through the spiritual, spiritual things of life with some best friends. And uh, it's been a fun journey since January, huh? Going through the minor prophets. It's been, uh, it's been, a, been a fun time. When I, when I last taught on the minor prophets, I was a college pastor. And uh, I kept announcing Malachi, the Italian prophet. And I was interrupted as I was getting ready to speak by... Uh, college students bringing garlic bread down the aisle. Uh, and so we ate garlic bread and read Malachi or Malachi together. So those were good times. So turn your Bibles to, to Malachi. And uh, what's funny is I mentioned that there are some people who were there in that college ministry. Do you remember that? That was only 60 years ago before B- Buzz Aldrin landed on the moon. So just kidding, seeing if you guys are awake out there. So can I get another stand? Is there another uh, stool or something, babe? By babe, I mean my wife. <laughs> Not the other babes that are hanging out here today. <laughs> so, okay, <laughs> sweet, 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 sweet. Um, speaking of college ministry, um, one of the most interesting experiences I, I had as a college pastor was getting a phone call at the church one afternoon by a guy that was obviously ticked off at God in the church. And by ticked off, I mean, thank you, Jacob. I'm not going to call you babe, all right? (laughs) And by ticked off, I mean the gentleman started the conversation with me by saying, you're just one of those Christians that's in it for the money, aren't you? (laughs) So I know this is going in a positive direction, right? So I remained on the line with this gentleman, and he just said, you know, just just be honest. You're you're faking it. You, You don't really love Jesus. You're just doing this for the money. Prove to me your, your faith in Jesus is real. And I'm sitting there going, how do you do that? He said, why don't you meet me at Scottsdale Fashion Square in the food court? I'd love to talk to you more. And I said, all right, what's your name? We exchanged names. I told him what, I, you know, I was easily locatable. So I go to Scottsdale Fashion Square. And uh, the senior pastor I was working for at the time is thinking, this is maybe not a good idea. But, you know, I, I set out to, to meet this, this stranger to talk about the sincerity of faith. And I'm sitting at the table, and this gentleman walks over to me, right? Doesn't say anything to me. Sets a wad of cash on the table and walks away. A wad, by wad, I mean $100 bills, this thick, banded up right there on the table. And I'm just kind of sitting there looking at it, looking around, going, what do I do? I'm thinking... You know, it could be early retirement fund for, for my wife, my, you know, future kids, things like that. And he comes back about five minutes, ten minutes later and says, why don't you take it? I said, that's not what I'm here for. And he goes, well, it, it's there. I'm, I'm giving it to you. I said, that's not what I want. You said you wanted to talk about spirituality, and that's why I'm here. He sits down and goes, what if I had a gun right now on me? Would you die for Jesus? And my heart just started pounding a little bit harder at that moment because I'm saying I should have sized this guy up before he sat down. Like, is he packing heat right here in the middle of Chandler Fashion? I mean, when was the last time someone shot somebody at Chandler Fa- or Scottsdale Fashion Square? I don't know. Would I be the first? I said, I would gladly die for Jesus. I said, what a privilege it would be to give my life for somebody who gave his life for me. He said, you're a liar. Would these people even care? I said, I would love to just stand up and declare my allegiance to Jesus in front of all these people. And if you chose to kill me right here, right then, right there, I'd gladly do it. He got up again and left. The money was still there. He comes back, same conversation, literally for about an hour. We're playing this kind of cat and mouse, spiritual cat and mouse thing. And finally, I said, I don't want your money. If you want to talk about Jesus, great, we can talk about Jesus. And he grabbed the money and got up and left. Got back to the church office. I think my senior pastor was glad to see me alive and, and, and intact. But early on in my spiritual journey, there was something that gripped a hold of, grabbed a hold of my heart that said, you just don't play games with God. You, 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 you take what God has given to you, and you you take it seriously. So much so that 
I probably allowed my zealousness for Jesus to probably run roughshod over some people in my life. And I regret those days. You ever meet those Christians that are like, they're almost like Shiite Christians. Do you guys know those type of Christians? Who really go like, I used to drive down the street and throw Bible tracks in people's cars and through car windows. And I, I was, you know, there was a point where I go, okay, I can be zealous for Christ without being an idiot for Jesus. And, and this, this situation at Scottsdale Fashion Square was just one opportunity for me to declare my allegiance to Jesus. To somebody who obviously had a, had a chip on their shoulder. But one thing that, that I've always been, been set on is I will always be faithful to Christ. However imperfectly that looks, I'm going to be faithful to him because think about how faithful he's been to me and to you. And so I've always embraced kind of a no BS Christianity. You're in the no BS zone this morning. Did you guys realize that? You're in the no BS zone, and there's a reason that because God wants to cut through the BS and get to the heart of what really matters. So I'm going to apologize ahead of time and tell you that the next two messages out of Malachi are aimed for your heart. Because there's one thing I want you to know is that when you follow Jesus, there's no BS. When you follow Jesus, you take it seriously. And God does not want you to play games. And this is the message of Malachi. He's the no BS prophet. So go ahead and write that in your Bible. Right there at the intro, right? Malachi is the no BS prophet. This is the guy who just says to those who call themselves lovers of God, consider the magnitude of his love for you. And consider how you're living in response to his love. And if your response is one of ingratitude, apathy, complacency, indifference, you name it, then you don't understand the magnitude of God's love. We ought to be gripped continually by a God that loves us as we are where we are and yet has designed a path for us to to prosper and to be successful and to live life the way he designed us to live. And Malachi wants to cut through all the BS and say, get back to the heart of being in awe of God and living for his glory. And so what's amazing about Malachi, it's the last book of the Old Testament. And before we get to Matthew, which is the next book in your Bible, in those, those few amount of pages that exist between Malachi and, Ma- and Matthew, there's 400 silent years from God. It's almost like he says, I'm going to give you some stuff to think about, I'm going to give you some stuff to chew on, and I'm going to let you sit on it for 400 years. And then all of a sudden, Jesus comes along. But what he leaves in the hearts and the minds and the ears of of his people are things that we ought to consider as, as weighty matters. Because there's one thing that God wants from you. He doesn't want your religious activity and service and busyness. He wants your hearts. He did not come to save you so that you can attend church perfectly. Pastor, you're keeping a ledger on my attendance, aren't you? I've been here every Sunday for the past six months. Well, good for you. I don't care. What I care about is a heart that is fully devoted to him who has been fully devoted to you. And however imperfectly we navigate this path, because the world is trying to distract us, the world is trying to trip us up, the world is trying to woo us with enticements, and yet God every day wakes up and says, look to me, be satisfied in me, find everything in me, because the world is not going to give you what your soul craves, that can only be found in God through Jesus Christ. And so Malachi helps us navigate this. And he perhaps speaks more boldly, more decisively, more on point to the things we struggle with, probably more than any other prophet. So Malachi, chapter 1 into chapter 2 this morning, we're going to look at two main points. There's a message of God's love, and then there's a message of God's rebuke. You can read the book of Malachi in probably less than 10 minutes. 
but don't take its brevity as, as content that's not important. 55 verses. 47 of them are direct words from God. 27 questions arise out of the text. That's one question every two verses. He's going to ask pointed questions. He's going to make us wrestle with the questions. He's going to ask us to inspect our hearts. Why? Because he wants wholly devoted followers of Jesus. That's what he's after. The Father seeks after one thing, according to John chapter 4, those who are going to worship him in spirit and in truth. He wants nothing more from you. Church attendance doesn't matter. Amen? A perfect prayer life doesn't matter. Amen? Perfect singing voices doesn't matter. Amen? He wants your hearts. And he wants a daily desperation and yearning from you that seeks only him because he wants you to know that only he will satisfy. That's the message of Malachi. Because here's a people that have grown indifferent and apathetic and just cold because God hasn't come through on his promises. Have you ever been in that waiting period where you just sense God saying something to you, but you're like, when, God? Perhaps it's the future spouse that you have yet to meet. Perhaps it's the future children that you have yet to have. Perhaps it's that future job that you're just looking to land. And God just seems to be inactive in your life. Don't let your inactivity and don't let your waiting lead you to a place where you go cold in your affection to him. He has you in those places. We're going to call them holding patterns. When are we going to land this thing, Lord? Just wait. I'm going to wait till the conditions are right. And when are the conditions right? It's when he has your heart. And you want nothing else but him. Because the real question is, even if you don't get married, will you still love him? with everything when you don't have children that you want children will you still love him when you don't have that job when the when the situations around you don't work out the way you want them to work out will you still love him job is the poster child of this don't be like job's wife who basically said job things aren't working out god's causing you to suffer just curse him and die thank you appreciate that we all need an encourager in our corner don't we But he said, even though the Lord has taken so much from me, children, houses, possessions, Job can declare, even though he has taken from me, he's slain me, that's his words, I know that my Redeemer lives. Nothing means more to the person who loves God than the fact that they have been loved and have Christ, and that means everything in the world. Amen? Malachi, chapter 1. And I will tell you that there's a severe word towards the people of God because sin is something that we have to continue to wrestle with within our own hearts. Even though as believers in Christ, we have been freed from the penalty of sin through the cross of Jesus Christ, God no longer holds you guilty. Christ has taken that guilt You're free from the penalty of sin. As a believer in Christ, you're also free from the power of sin. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. He's given you the Holy Spirit so that you can be victorious over the sin that so easily entangles you. One day we'll be free from the presence of sin. That's going to be awesome, isn't it? But in the meantime, we exist in this, this holding pattern until he comes back to take us home we still have to do battle with our own hearts. The lingering effects of sin, the lingering influence of the old person that we once were before Christ. And that's why when it comes to to God's people, there's no greater heartbreak that God experiences than when his own people who are called by his name sin. It's easy for us to point our finger at the world and be like, those sinners those evil malcontents, those, you know, and we're pointing the finger, and yet those are people that don't have God's law. We who have God's law and yet have relationship with him, with him we're the ones that break his heart the most. And that's why he starts in verse 1. Here's the oracle of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. Some of your translations say the burden. And I'm going to tell you, this is a burden to preach a message like this. It is a burden. 
Can I just tell you how many times I come before you and I sit there and go, God, do I have to say this? Do we have to talk about this? And at the end of the day, we do because I would do you a disservice if we neglected the whole counsel of God's word to us. I could pull a Thomas Jefferson on you and and cut out all those places of the Bible that just really convict us. And then what do you have? You have chicken soup for the lame soul. That's what you have. The burden of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. The burden of the Lord to Missy O'Day through Pastor Scott. No, I'm not changing God's word. Some of you are like, Pastor. Verse 2. I have loved you. Circle those verses, that phrase. Right out the gate, God says, I have loved you. You want to know where the people of God's hearts are at? But you say, how have you loved us? Shame on these people. It's like my kids, right? The moment I say no to them, Dad, you don't care about us. Really? You really want to see how I don't care about you? Yeah, and then they're like, okay, you care about us, you care about us. You ever been around a child that just forgets the fact that you've, you've brought them into this world? You ever been around a child who's just forgotten the fact that you, you took care of them, you fed them, you've, you've, you've changed their diapers, you, you've, you've potty trained them, you, you're trying to steer them on the right path when it comes to morals and ethics and values, and then all of a sudden that you know, 10-year-old just is like, Dad, you don't love me. Really? Has my, has my relationship to you ever shown you my lack of love? The fact that you're here and you're clothed and you have life and breath and I didn't take you out day one? Really? I mean, these are a bunch of spoiled brats. How have you loved us, God? See, the problem is, they're allowing their current circumstances to blind them to the fact that God's been more than loving to them. Has that, has that ever happened to you? You've just lost sight of how God, how good God's been to you? You ever thought about communion like we just celebrated? There's part of me that sits there and goes, we should do it every day. Why? Because we should never forget about the cross of Christ. The greatest demonstration of God's love for us. And yet we sit there and go, God, how have you loved us? I don't have what I I want. And we act like a bunch of spiritual brats. You know, we have this entitlement like, well, you know what, God? You know, yeah, you saved me. That's nice. But I really want this. Well, what you're saying is you don't want the cross. You want whatever, fill in the blank, that your your heart's craving. How have you loved us, Lord? And then he says, Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord, yet I have loved Jacob. So now God gets historical. And sometimes this is what happens when when there's conflict and one person's not thinking correctly. They get hysterical. The goal is to get historical. Remember. Let's go back a couple thousand years, talk about Jacob and Esau, a, a, an account that they would be very familiar with. You guys remember what happened with Jacob and Esau? Let me give you a, a quick reminder. Even though Esau was the firstborn, even though Esau had the rights to the privileges and the blessings of the firstborn, God chose Jacob over Esau, which was unheard of in this culture. So essentially God's saying, well, the world operates like this, but I'm going to operate differently. See, the world would say you're entitled, you're privileged, you, you've got these blessings because of, of, the, of, of the order in which you're born. You're the firstborn, you get everything. All of a sudden God comes and turns that world upside down and says, I'm going to pass over Esau and I'm going to love Jacob. I'm going to choose Jacob. This was unheard of. This was not according to the culture or the customs. And yet God does it. Why? Because he wants us to know that he is a God who does something that often goes against the grains of this world. And he shows his love for us. And that while we are undeserving, we're not the firstborn, we're not entitled, we don't have the privileges, that he's going to say, I'm going to set my affection upon you. 
And this is why there's four things regarding God's love we need to talk about. First is this, God's electing love, God's unconditional love, God's sovereign love, and God's free love. Verse 3, but I have hated Esau and have made his mountains a desolation and appointed his inheritance for the jackals of the wilderness. He hates Esau in the sense that he has not designated Esau as a recipient of his love. He's chosen freely Jacob to, to show him his love, but he's passed over Esau, which in the world's eyes would seem like that's uncaring, that's unfair, you hate him. And essentially, biblical language speaks, I prefer Jacob over Esau. See, this is the beauty of election. Ephesians chapter 1, write that down, look at it later. Before the foundation of the world, before you were ever a glimmer in your mommy and daddy's eyes, God from eternity past said, I'm going to choose you. I'm going to choose to love you. I'm going to choose to set my love upon you. I'm going to choose to change your heart. And before anything was ever done, God said in his heart, I'm going to elect you. He has to do that. Why? Because our hearts don't want him. Our minds wander from him. We're nothing but rebels deep down in our nature. And so God does something that's against our power and against the powers of this world. And he says, I'm going to set my affection upon you. This is the beauty of God's electing love. Did Israel have a choice in being chosen as God's people, the, the, the representatives of God on earth? No. But he chooses to work through them. See, this is the beauty of election. The moment you think you're deserving and you're entitled, the moment God sits there and goes, you deserve nothing. You ever think that's harsh? You ever think like, wow, God, really? And he says, yeah, really. I'm holy divinity, you're sinful humanity, what, what do I have to do for you? And I tell people all the time, he would be perfectly just and right to just condemn us all to hell for eternity. But, he chooses to love some. This blows my mind. See, so many people get wrapped up in like, Esau, he hated that, that's not right. I sit there and go, don't be consumed about the Esau hated part. Be concerned about the Jacob he loved part. That's what blows my mind. The fact that we think we're entitled when we're really not. And the greatness of God looms larger in the heart of the person that realized they are undeserving. Don't forget that. If God's not great, something else is great, and I don't even want to tackle that. If God's not great, then something else is welling up within your heart and is a small G God, and you need to do battle with that because you don't deserve anything. How's that for inspirational messages? I came to church, and pastor pulled the rug right out from under me. Yeah, we all need it. Because you are not all that, but because of Jesus, he has made you all that. His electing love, his electing grace is awesome. And you are never to boast in anything except for Jesus Christ. That's why unconditional love is such an important point. Number two, God didn't look ahead and think, Wow, Jesse is fantastic. Diana, phenomenal. Samantha, look at her. I mean... We used to sit there and go, there's nothing in me that was attractive to God. There is nothing at the end of the day that God's going to say, you know, here's why I chose Pastor Scott. Because, you know, he's going to get through seminary and he's going to pastor a church and love people. And pe he sits there and goes, I will choose whom I choose and whom I choose is up to me. And it's never based upon a condition in you. It's solely based upon my sovereign choice in myself. So the moment you sit there and start setting conditions on who you think God will love, you better pull that thing back and realize God does not love based upon condition. He chooses unconditionally. Jacob could never take credit for being chosen, right? Deuteronomy 7, Moses squashes that right away and says, you were the smallest of all the nations. You were the ugliest of all the nations, right? This is God's way of saying you cannot take credit. 
It was purely an unconditional choice from God. And if you think God was coerced somehow into choosing Jacob and Israel, it's where we get to sovereign love. God chooses because he is God, he is Lord, and he chooses as he deems to choose, and we sit back and fall more in love with a God who is sovereign over all things and yet chooses to love some of us? What? And perhaps one of the greatest realities of God's love is that it's free. You don't have to perform to earn God's love. You don't have to attend church perfectly. You don't have to read the Bible perfectly. You can mess up in sharing Jesus with people and misquote verses and just really, really fail. And God says, I love you freely. Come to me, all who are weary, and and you'll find rest. Come to know me, who is the word, who is the truth, who's the life, who's the bread, who's the water. Find in me joy. Come freely. Is that not a great invitation? So many times we feel like we have to jump through so many spiritual, religious hoops, and God says, no. The free gift of eternal life is for you. Believe. Believe. And yet, how have you loved us? Verse 4, though Edom says we have been beaten down, we will return and build up the ruins, thus says the Lord of hosts. You know, you may do all you want. This is the world speaking. We're going to build up our, our power. We're going to build up our fortifications. And God says, I'm going to destroy them. Verse 5, and in your eyes you will see this, and you will say, the Lord be magnifying beyond the border of Israel. Here's what God's getting to. We should never doubt. We should never question God's love. God has proven his love to us. And if he gave me Jesus and he didn't give me anything else, he is still worthy of all glory and honor and praise. I'm going to say that again. Because someone needs to hear that one more time. If God gave you Jesus and gave you nothing else, he would still be deserving of all glory, honor, and praise. Amen? Because if you are not going to praise God, for what he's done he says there are going to be other people in the world that are going to magnify his name there are going to be people who praise him and glorify him and honor him and this is the reality of it churches are filled right now at this moment with people who would call themselves christians but don't honor god at all in their lives and that there's people that you would see on the outside and go they do not love god and yet their hearts are welling up in praise and adoration before god Don't trust the little old lady with the tight bun looking like she's sucking on a lemon in the church. Perhaps the guy that's tatted out with big gauges in his ears, the one who's really expressing holy devotion to the Lord. Those old Baptist women, you've got to be careful. I've been in those environments. They win you over with potlucks and buffets and things like that. It's, it's insidious. The message of God's love is this. May your hearts melt daily before a God who didn't have to love you but does. Where you're at, He loves you. What you're wrestling with, He loves you. No matter how imperfect your life has been, He loves you. And don't you dare question it. He's more faithful than the faithful of all friends. He's more committed than you would ever imagine. Why? Because before the foundation of the world, he chose you in Christ to love you. Ephesians chapter 1. And yet, how do the people of God respond? They don't respond positively. Here are the messages of rebuke, three of them. You guys ready for this? It's going to get hardcore here. It's going to get nasty. It might get a little R-rated. You guys ready? The rebuke has to do with three areas. Worthless worship. Insolent indifference. Meaningless marriages. I was thinking about giving my very best to somebody and not having it reciprocated, treated poorly. I couldn't help but think about 
junior high girlfriends. You know, those seasons of our lives where we just think like, wow, we've got it all figured out and I met the one true love and we're destined forever, Romeo and Juliet, right? Well, maybe not the ending, but, you know, everything up to that. And I was thinking about girlfriends in junior high and what I gave to these girls and it was never reciprocated. I mean, I made them mixtapes. <laughs> and yet there was so little given back. I backward skated during couples skate at the local roller rink. And I didn't know how to backward skate, but I did it. Why? Because I love them. And yet that love wasn't reciprocated. Drop me quickly. And I sit there and go, that's not even close to imagining what God's heart must go through when he does so much for us. And yet we are just deaf and blind and dumb to the love of God. Look at verse 6. As a son honors his father and a servant his master, if then I'm a father, where's my honor? If I'm a master, where's my respect? The Lord of hosts says to you, O priest who despise my name, but you say, how we despise your name? Well, guess what? You're going to ask a question like that. God's going to answer. And notice who he's going for. He's going for the leaders in the church. He's going for the spiritual leaders of the community. And there is, there's, there's a big responsibility, right? That according to James 3, that those who teach incur a stricter judgment. The fact that I stand before you preaching this message, it's like I, there's, a, there's, a, there's a sobering reality that I'm accountable to the Lord by what I share with you. And that I don't take these things lightly, that I treat them with respect and honor, and that I come before you as a humble vessel to say, this is what I believe God's word saying. Listen, heed, pay attention. Does anyone else want my job? And yet, the priest who had an incredible privilege treated their position with such dishonor and disrespect. Can I tell you, I've been in circles with other pastors and I just sit there and go, if there was a pastor badge on you, I'd rip it right off. I'm that kind of guy, right? Flipping tables, that's not necessarily my scene, but ripping the pastor badge off, I'll, I'll do that. I remember one seminary class, I stood before a class of, of pastors and I was preaching on purity, sexual purity and honoring our marriages. And, and I told them, I said, I tell you what, if I find out that any one of you have been unfaithful to your wife, if I read about your name in a paper, I'm coming after you. Because I would hope you'd do the same for me. We're held to a higher standard. I, I'm living my life before you, and I realize that I could say one thing, and it could really come back to bite me. I could do one thing, and it could really come back to bite me. My wife can say something. Or just, you have to realize we live our lives in a fishbowl. You're all watching the world's watching and they're just waiting for one little mess up. That's why I covet your prayers. It's not easy. Sometimes it's a burden. But the reality of it is, like I stood there in the middle of Scottsdale Fashion Square, I'll die for him. I'll die for him. I, I'm, I'm taking my calling in Christ seriously. I'll die for him. In the world, there's a quote that says, if, if you're going to light yourself on fire, the world will come out and watch you burn. Well, I guess that's happening right now. Right? Here we go. Matthew, I'm Malachi, Matthew. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. What does he say to the priest? Verse 7. You are presenting defiled food upon the altar, and you say, how we defiled you, and say that the table of the Lord is to be spised? Because when you present the blind sacrifice, is it not evil? When you present the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Why, not, uh, why am I not pleased with you, or why would I not receive you kindly, says the Lord host? Because he says, I have prescribed certain ways you are to worship me, and you're treating it with contempt. I've clearly laid out the rules, and you treat it with disdain. See, what they're doing is they're going before the Lord with all the types of animals and all the types of sacrifices that the Lord has clearly said, no, I don't want your leftovers. I don't want your sick. I don't want your lame. I don't want your defiled. I want the best of your herd. I want the best of your crops. I mean, 
Think about this, folks. If God has given you his best, do you think that he wants the best from you? Because I'm going to tell you, what you give to God in your worship to him reflects what you think you've received from God. And if you have been, if you've received God's grace and his mercy and his magnificence and his love through Jesus Christ, and God did not spare even his own son, but he gave you his best, what sort of response should that elicit within us, his people? Should we not also give him his be- our best? You better believe it. And yet the priest, the ones who should have known, didn't. They came to him, they said, Well, I've got this blind goat over here. Will you take that? And I've got this really messed up one-legged animal over here. Will you take that? And they turn the worship of God into something that did not honor God. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. One of the early Bible memory verses that one of my small group leaders gave me, and I committed to memory. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, sisters, in view of God's mercy, to present your lives as holy sacrifices, living sacrifices to the Lord, knowing that this is your acceptable and pleasing act of worship. You give your everything to God. Why? Because he gave his everything for you. And yet we casually walk into church and we look at the offering envelope and we sit there going, yeah, you know what? I'd rather spend my money elsewhere. And my heart has been wandering all week here and here. And we think that, you know, our religious activity on Sunday is going to somehow make up for our, our shortcomings during the week. No. No, 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 no. If you don't worship God Monday through Saturday, you don't worship God on Sunday. Got it? Do I need to say that again? Okay, one more time. If you're not worshiping God Monday through Saturday, this is BS. You say you honor God with your your finances, but you give them chump change. That's what we used to call it. Chump change. And if there's anything left over, that's what God gets. But we're too busy spending money on everything else. God says, I want your first fruits. God says, I want the first of your harvest. I want the best of your produce. I want the best of this, the best of this. And yet, somehow we've relegated God to, you know, God, whatever I got left over, you can have. My time, my treasure, my talents. And God says, that is not acceptable. You give me your lives. And when, you ha- when I have your lives, then I know I've got everything else. That's why Jesus commended the woman who came in and all the other religious leaders were throwing their chump change into the, into the coffers. And yet that one woman who remains unnamed to this day comes in and gives everything she has. And it is a cause for celebration because Jesus calls the disciples over and goes, Watch her! Look at her! She has just those two slivers of copper and she gives it all that's worship because if you sacrifice when it's not really sacrifice then it's not really sacrifice amen c.s lewis says i don't know what the rule is to give but all i know is the only safe rule is to give more than you can spare god doesn't want what you can spare he wants it all and i'm not just saying that because i like talking about money and i'm one of those pastors that do i talk to other pastors like oh i don't touch money I don't even go on that topic. I said, I do it. Why? Because there's one thing we have all in common. And it has nothing to do with how much you have. It has to do with, with what you have. Does it all belong to God? I praise God for a generous church. And I don't want to squash the joy of those who give regularly and give consistently. I thank God for you. I'm more concerned about those of you who have probably never given a dime to this date. And I'm not concerned about what you're giving or what you're not giving. I'm concerned about your heart. Even when my wife and I, years ago, were barely making anything, first check we would write to the Lord. You're good, God. You've taken care of us. We have a home over our roof over our head, a clothes on our back, food in our stomach. But you know what? We're barely making anything. But you know what? You're going to get the top. You're going to get the top. Joyfully giving to God. And not just my, our, our, our money, but, but our, our, our heart's affection, the things we're longing for, the things we're clamoring for. Because if you fail to see the greatness of God and what he's done for you, you will grow callous in your affection for him. 
And the things of this world will all of a sudden appear exciting, but they're really not. You can binge watch all the Netflix you want. Nothing's going to replace the excitement God wants to plant in your heart. Amen? Give it up for binge watch. Any binge watchers out there? Yeah, sinners. Okay, here we go. But now will you entreat God's favor, verse 9, that he may be gracious to us with such offering on your part? Will he receive you kindly? God says, don't come to me and weep tears at the altar when your hearts are not even in the right place. God does not want your shallow repentance. God does not want your hollow brokenness. Look at this. Oh, that there were one among you, verse 10, I love this, that would just shut the gates. Essentially, I just wish someone was here and just said, you know what? This is all BS. Let's just lock the door. Why even be here? I mean, I could go golf. I got six guys that would love to go golf on a Sunday morning. Why? Because this is nothing but BS. It's shallow. It's surfacy. Close the door of the churches. Would that be awesome? Like you walk up to a church, it's like, it's Sunday morning. No one's here. Yeah, why? Because all the hypocrisy that's been taking place here. Close due to hypocrisy. This is ballsy. Is it not? But yet... How many people go through the holy charade? They, they got this facade. Love Jesus, love Jesus, and yet heart is far from Christ. And God says, close the doors of the church because it is a stench. Oh, I just, just wish there was someone, man enough, woman enough, just to say, we're closed. Because we'd rather close the doors and seek God earnestly than have the doors open and seek him hypoc- hypocritically. You guys are sitting there going, this stuff is good. It hurts. But it's in the scriptures. Why? Because God's concerned about something. From the rising of the sun, even to the setting, my name will be great among the nations in every place. Incense is going to be offered in my name. Grain offering that's pure. My name will be great among the nations. He's saying, this is about the world being reached with the love of, of God. And if my people, Israel, fail to worship me, they're going to be people from other lands, other nations, other people groups that will do it. And they will do it honestly. They will do it earnestly. But you are profaning it, verse 12, in that you you say at the table the Lord is defiled and its fruits, its food is to be despised. You say, oh, how tiresome it is. They basically say, God, you know why we're doing this? Because we're bored. We're bored. You disdainfully sniff at it, says the Lord of hosts, and you bring what was taken by robbery and what was lame, sick. You bring the offering. Shall I receive it from your hand? The curse be the swindler who has male in his flock, vows it, but sacrifice basically their their word of commitment has nothing to do with what they're actually going to fulfill. Ecclesiastes 5, 5 says, if you make a vow, honor your vow. If you say you're going to give the Lord your best, give him your best. He knows. He smells duplicity. End of chapter 1. Shall we continue? We need to. Worthless worship. Remember Romans chapter 12. You come to God because he's come to you with his best. You give him your best. You give him the best. You be the best in your vocation. You be the best husband, wife, child you can possibly be. You give the best in your service to the Lord. You give the best of your finances to him. Every aspect of your life is not to be compartmentalized, but taken as a whole, you give your best to God. Amen? Have a great work ethic. Don't be the kind of Christian at your workplace where people go, oh man, they're, they're here again, they didn't call in sick. I wish they would have called in sick today. Be the best employee, be the best employer. Do I have any baristas here today? I mean, I know you're right, ready to stand up and say Scott's the best employer, right? But I've got great employees you know why my wife and I and kids are going to go on vacation and we're trusting the shop to them and, and I know they do a fantastic job. And some of them want to honor God in that. And I said, they go, yes! May their tribe increase. Amen? What about insolent indifference? Look at verse 1, chapter 2. We're not done yet. Five, ten more minutes. And this is a commandment for you, O priest. If you do not listen, if you do not take it to heart, are you guys ready? This gets a little R-rated right here. Are you ready? Some of you are like, yeah, let's get into it. All right, here we go. I'm going to come to you. I'm going to bring a curse. I'm going to curse your blessings. Indeed, I have cursed them already because you have not taken it to heart. Behold, I'm going to come and rebuke your offspring, and I will spread refuse on your faces. The refuse of your feasts, you will be taken away with it. 
he basically says that which is undefiled and unclean, the refuse that is taken from animals that during the sacrifice they would remove from the animal, take outside the camp and put it in a dung heap. God says, I'm going to take that very thing that you consider unclean. I'm going to smear all of your faces. (gasps) Well, that's not loving. You want to believe it is. Because God will go to severe means to get your attention. And if it means spreading refuse on your face, you sit there and go, what? Because this was the worst thing an Israelite could ever imagine, especially a priest in the service to the Lord. It would consider them unclean, it would consider them undefiled, and they would no longer be able to serve in the house of God. And God says, this is how you have treated me. Then you will know that I have sent this commandment to you. My covenant may continue with Levi, says the Lord of hosts. See, Levi was the head of the Levites, the tribe that was never given any land, but had a special opportunity to serve God in the purposes of worship. And what does God expect in our worship? Look at verses 6 and 7. True instruction is to be in our mouths. Unrighteousness is not found on our lips. We walk with him in peace and uprightness, and he turned many back from iniquity. For the lips of the priest should preserve knowledge, and men should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. Right there in those two verses, verses 6 and 7, highlight those, circle them, box them in, whatever you need to do. You need to know this is what God is after. The heart of somebody who says, you know what, I'm going to honor God with the way I talk. I'm going to honor God with the way I walk. I'm going to honor God in having daily communion with Him. I'm going to honor Him by, by bringing other people who don't know Him to Him. There's a burden so that people may find life in the giver of life. And then there's a passion to share God's Word, however good or however difficult it may be. You read verses 6 and 7, this is God saying, this is how I want you to live. But yet the priests weren't there. And they treated the things of God with indifference. And so much so, perhaps one of the more haunting places, verse 8 says, but because you have done this, you have turned aside from the way many who have, and you have caused many to stumble by your instruction. Have you ever considered the weightiness that perhaps our waywardness, our disobedience, is also helping other people not get closer to God, but walk further away from Him. Oh, my. You know what Jesus said about those who would cause somebody else to stumble? Severe judgment. Matthew 5, Matthew 18. For you who cause even one of the little ones to stumble, there'll be a millstone tied around your neck. Judgment. Think about not only your heart before God, but your walk before Him and how your walk could be negatively impacting lives of those around you. Hard words. Worthless worship, insolent indifference because they've lost sight of the greatness of God that's now impacted to the very fabric of community and that is in their marriages. Look at verse 10. And I'll close with this, and we'll pick it up next time. But I'll make a couple comments. Do we not all have one Father? Verse 10. Has not one God created us? Why do we deal so treacherously against His brothers so as to profane the covenant of our fathers? God is concerned about community. He's concerned about our relationships with each other. But He specifically talks about the greatest relationship that holds the fabric of community together, and that is the relationship between a man and a woman in in marriage. Judah has dealt treacherously, and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem, for Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. The men of Israel are marrying women outside of their camp. The men of Israel are taking for themselves wives of other nations, of other religions, of other people groups. God says this is problematic. We'll talk about that here in a moment. Verse 12, And as for the man who does this, may the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob everyone who awakes and answers or who presents an offering to the Lord of hosts. 
And this is another thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and with groaning because he has he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with the favor from your hands. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth against whom you have dealt treacherously, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Meaning not only are these men marrying foreign women, they're divorcing their wives from within the camp to marry these foreign women. And he says in verse 4, 15, but not one has done so who has a remnant of the spirit. And what did that one do while he was seeking a godly offspring? Take heed to your spirit and let no one deal treacherously against the wife of your youth. For I hate divorce, says the Lord. The God of Israel and him who covers his garment with wrong, says the Lord of hosts. So take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. Can I just stop right there and just tell you something regarding divorce? Divorce is not the unforgivable sin. I need to say that to you. Because there are some people who have experienced such harsh treatment from the church where they have been excommunicated, they have been treated as if this is the unpardonable sin. Nowhere in the Bible does it ever say divorce is the unforgivable or unpardonable sin. Amen? There's a lot of people here who have been divorced, who have been affected by divorce, who had come from parents who had divorced. With that said, we have a lot to learn in in treating marriage as precious and as awesome as it needs to be. We have a lot to learn in this area. And God says clearly there's two things that are important regarding marriage. Number one, you marry somebody of the opposite sex. And number two, you marry somebody with the same worldview you have. I'm, I'm saving you a lot of headache and heartache for those of you who are not married. You marry somebody of the opposite sex and you marry somebody who shares the same world, you, i.e., who loves Jesus as earnestly and as honestly and as desperately as you do. Do not balk at this. Because some of you want to be so happy, you're going to marry that guy who you think loves Jesus but doesn't drip love for Jesus at all. Some guy out there is going to meet some girl and say, she goes to church. That's not the question I asked you. See, the reason I say God is between a man and a woman is because God's plan in marriage has been to produce godly offspring of that relationship. Man, woman, marriage, this is how God has designed it from creation. Genesis affirms it. Jesus affirms it. Malachi affirms it. Paul affirms it. The Bible is clear. Marriage is between a man and a woman with the goal of producing holy offspring. Am I clear on this? Okay? I'm not discounting someone's feelings or emotions they may have when it comes to same-sex attraction. I'm not... I'm not questioning somebody's inner battle with this or struggle with this. I want to come alongside the person and affirm them in this, in the sense that they are precious in the eyes of God. They're a created person by a holy God. But what we have to be careful of is allowing our feelings and our emotions be the driver in our life. Because I could talk to another guy who says, you know what, I really feel like being married to 20 women right now. Really? What's enough? I was waiting. I was going to put it out there, but someone said it. See, we have to realize we live in a society that is deriving its identity out of their sexuality. That's not where your identity is found. Your identity is found in being created in the image of God as a man or a woman. I don't know what's happened since then, but we, every situation's different. And we love them. We treat them with dignity and respect. We try to guide them. To, why? Because the fabric of community has been from the beginning. Creational order says there will be a man and a woman. This is God's ideal. They will produce godly offspring. That's why one worldview, a same worldview, is important. Because I've talked to too many people who said, well, I'm this and he's this. I sit there and go, train wreck. Wait. Don't settle. Wait. Amen? 
Some of you are like, I've been settling for 40 years. Wait. I know, ladies, there's good, godly, there's good godly men out there, but they're few and far between. Amen? Just wait. Guys, same thing. Just wait. We, are, we want results like that. And all of a sudden, we make a quick decision and marry somebody, and we end up spending 40 years of hell because we married the wrong person. Why? Because they didn't uh, uh, embrace the same worldview we embrace. Better long engagement than long period of hell in marriage. Amen? That's good. Godly offspring produced by a man and woman in holy matrimony, a man and woman that share the same worldview. This is God's ideal. Because history shows us the Roman Empire. Historians say the two things, and we're going to bring it to close right here. Two things that led to the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Number one, Divorce was rampant. And number two, Christianity was hypocritical. What did we just talk about today? I don't want to be talking about the fall of the American empire. As I think about independence today, I'm grateful for the place we live. I've been all over the world, and I've seen the conditions and the environments and the governments and I sit there and go, ladies and gentlemen, you may not agree with what's going on with health care. You may not agree with the President of the United States. You may not agree with travel bans going on between states like California and Texas. What a bunch of idiots. All I know is that whether you want to point out all the, the misgivings and misfortunes and mistakes that we make as a country, doggone it, we have been afforded a great place to live. And I thank God for the founding fathers. I thank God for the men and women who have fought so bravely. Many have given their lives for the freedom that we have. I rejoice in our independence. Do not discount what I'm saying to you. But I'm saying if we don't get our act straight when it comes to our hypocrisy and getting rid of the hypocrisy before a holy God and honoring our marriages the way God wants to honor our marriage, we are on a slow decline to death. That's what I'm saying. That's what Malachi is saying. 1,500 years ago, today, the message hasn't changed. I love you guys. (laughs) I love you guys. The burden of the Lord is truly that it's a burden. But praise God, He's a God who lifts those burdens. If you're willing to find life and love and freedom in Christ. Will you get there today? Will you experience that? And will you live it tomorrow? Will you live it on Tuesday? Amen? Let's stand. Let's pray. To be continued. And if you think God is going to get lighter on his message, he's not. I may call, I may call out sick in, in, on the next message. It's heavy. Read ahead if you want a sneak preview. I'm praying for all of you, and I want you to know when I pray for you, the prayer I always pray for you, the church, the men and women I love. May my people that you've entrusted to me walk in purity and righteousness in a manner worthy of their calling in Christ Jesus. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week, all right? We'll see you soon. Meet someone you've never met before. Love on somebody you've never met before. We've met before. Yeah. Let me turn my mic off.